Okay, so um, <laughs> I guess as, as you've seen now, we've given you data that is from 10x, so that's a droplet-based method. Um, so it's quite uh, different in the characteristics compared to plate-based in the terms of the number of genes that you detect and the, um, that the data is a lot more sparse, so you have a lot more zeros. Um, and yeah, for these technologies, you usually get a lot of cells, so thousands of cells. Um, so you will be working with only a few, um, like a subset of the of the cells, just to keep it manageable and and everything to run quicker. Um, but um, I guess so. You read in the data and the metadata, and then convert that into a single cell experiment object. So I hope that was all straightforward. Um, and then we add the annotation. So all of this is exactly the same as we were doing with the other data set. Um, I guess it came up yesterday that you need to be careful when you retrieve the annotation. Sometimes the order of the retrieved like gene symbols will not be the same as what you have in your count data, so you have to match those two so that you assign the correct gene symbol to the correct gene ID. So those are type of types of things that you need to be careful about, and that's why we put for example, these um, checks. Is that okay? Yeah. But somehow it's faster to just sort uh, data at the beginning. It takes much less time uh, than matching match formula. You, you, you can do that as well, but you should always just have a statement checking that you actually have the same order in both objects, because otherwise you might not realize that you've assigned the wrong thing. Okay, so in terms of QC, again, um, at least data generated from 10x technologies is with the 10x platform, it's usually quite clean. Um, so from the plots, the violin plots, you can see that most of the data has pretty similar statistics. There are not many outliers. Um, so the library sizes tend to be smaller again than compared to the droplet. Yes. Yeah. How do I know whether to check for the channel or for the day, or do I have to do both? So that's in the metadata, right? Yeah. What do you mean to check for it? Like whether to check this for the channel? channel. No, that's also to do oh, the I base. see. So, like in general, you have to check for both, don't you? Yeah, yeah. but in this case, they're correlated, right? So channel one and channel two is day one, and channel three is day two. Oh, right. So, I mean, you could do them both, but it's going to be the same in this particular case. Mm -hmm. um, so again, for example, in terms of number of genes, we have that one outlier, which is a cell that failed, but everything else looks pretty, pretty good. Um, and the same for the mitochondrial. In general, we have very low proportions of mitochondrial genes. Um, a few outliers, but nothing much. So the QC in this case is quite straightforward because the data is already very clean. Um, so those are the, the thresholds that uh, are reported in the paper. Do you think they're sensible? Would you choose something different? You could, you could be more strict if you want, no? Yeah. Like with, at least with the ones, yeah. yeah, so you could take him down down for to two yeah. or one point five something like that. Yeah. But uh, actually, I checked and it doesn't change much. Yeah, it's only a few cells yeah. that yeah. get removed. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in some cases, um, if you're not going to lose too much more and you want to be a bit stricter, that will give you a cleaner data set that probably will have less noise and it's easier to work with. So that's always uh, something that is good to check. Um, so yeah, I mean, in this case, again, because we have only, we're working with a restricted set of data, we have very few bad quality samples, but we remove those. Um, and then we can move on to normalization. Did so, you, sorry, just question, did you compute this um, QC matrix one as well? And did you use, for this one, you probably use more than 100, do you? Or how do you um, if you go up, I'm guessing. And then the definition of them. Before. I think before I this, when you're actually defining the this, um, the matrix. Uh, 
when you actually define the lib size. Or, yeah, so here, I think. So in terms of library size, you count the counts, so you take the sum of the columns, so basically oh, every count. Basically. Yeah, so the idea was yeah. to manually do it instead of just you know, blindly use Kato without yeah. thinking. So yeah. the, that's just another way of doing it yeah. if you don't want to use the built-in function. Yeah. Um, just to make sure you actually know what others yeah. are doing. Yeah. A tool for, for columns. Say again? And apply the yeah. tool for your applying this question by columns. Yeah, two. That, um, if you do apply column yeah. two, is So you want to count the number of genes yeah. in each cell. Yeah. yeah. You can also just do counts larger than zero, call sums to something. Okay, so <clears throat> for normalization, so again, um, as we've said, because it's droplet-based data, usually the mean counts will be a lot lower. So if you take the default value that it is one, then you are filtering most of the data and you're remaining, you're, you're keeping only a very small uh, proportion of the genes. So that is probably too stringent for this data set. So we move the threshold down to 0.1 instead of one. Um, and that, again, filters most of the very lowly expressed things, but gives us a good enough number of genes that we can estimate the size factors robustly. Um, so you should have gotten something like this. Again, very good correlation between the library size and the size factors, which tells us that the normalization was successful. And then you simply apply that to get now your count, your matrix of normalized counts. Yeah. Any questions on that? So now that we have the normalized counts, we can again just do quick PCA or Disney to see initially how the data looks like a little bit. Um, so again, we're just taking the top 100 most variable genes uh, just by total variance. And so this is what the PCA looks like a bit. So we have three major groups that are very, very different, and then everything else is kind of mixed. And if you actually plot them um, by the channel or by the, the different biological samples, you see that they all mix together quite well. So we don't seem to have any strong batch effects in this case. And again, if you plot now by library size, there is no obvious correlation that the cells are clustering by their library size, which tells us that the normalization Perfect. works successfully. That's basically number of counts per cell. So. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, so this is the raw library size before normalization. Um, so there's no relationship there anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was about it for that part. Any? Questions on that? I mean, it's no correlation that, I mean, there are around, randomly around zero, that there's no trend, there's no. For the library size. So if you perform the PCA, for example, with the row counts, usually you will see that the first PC just correlates with, with library size. So then you would go from the smallest to the largest. In this case, there is no obvious, like, um, yeah. Gradient, <coughs> yeah. 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 That would always be the case. Because the first PC, if you don't normalize your data, it's always a mean, so. It depends on the data. It depends on what's strongest. But usually the library size has a big effect before. Yeah. And that's why we normalize. So that's why we, need we to have to normalize. Like those normalize. <laughs> it's just a kind of sanity check that our normalization worked fine. Mm. Yeah. I was wondering, if you have any bias that you introduce and then you can see it with a TCA, can you still find differentially expressed genes by looking at other principal components? Like, let's say you have principal component one is explaining a lot of the batch effect or something like that. And then instead of focusing on that, you go to PC two and three or three and four and try to find differences there. Is that possible or you should not work with that data set? So usually the ideal thing to do is to try to correct batch effects. And if you have a good experimental design, there's methods to do that. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, yeah. yeah. Anything else? OK. Maybe we can give this to them. Yes, yeah, so we'll give you the, the, the solved practicals as well, so that you can compare your code to ours.
So, okay. Oh, you can see the whole thing. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna now just talk a little bit about batch correction methods. Um, because, um, as we've been mentioning, this is one of the biggest problems that we can encounter when we are looking at not only single cells, so this is something that has been worked on for a long time, and this is common to all types of RNA-seq and many other um, uh, genomic technologies. So, um, single cell RNA-seq, again, uh, has its own challenges when it comes to doing batch correction, and so new methods have had to be developed to um, uh, uh, be able to do this correctly with single cells. So um, one of the methods that we're going to discuss is called, uh, or it's based on mutual nearest neighbors, so I'll explain that in a second, but just to give you an example of what we are dealing with, so this is a PCA of two data sets, so the solid and the circle and the open circles come from two different data sets, one of it is plate-based and the other is droplet-based. So because these data sets are, and you get information that is quite different, again, in terms of the genes that you detect, the average counts, if you just do a PCA of all the data together, you can see that they are completely segregating depending on the technology. So the colors here should match or represent the actual cell types. So the, the, the um, green in both data sets are the same cell type, so they should be grouping together because they will have similar transcriptomes. But they don't because we have a batch effect that dominates and then separates them, and that's what we are capturing here. Um, so this is an extreme example of uh, very different types of data. So, um, but you can have that as well if, again, you perform an experiment in different days and you have a technical effect from just the preparation day. Um, even if, if, it's, if everything else is the same, you might still be clustering your cells based on the batch. So um, the method works um, basically by identifying mutual nearest neighbors. So the, the, the idea for bulk RNA-seq data is that if you have a technical batch effect, um, it should be a systematic bias that you see in your data. So you have whatever factor um, just affecting, so it might be the lab where the data was prepared and the day, the reagents, the person who did it, but that will systematically affect the gene expression in one of the data sets compared to the other. And so because it's systematic, it's affecting the whole data set in, uh, in a coordinated way, we can identify that effect and then correct for it. So basically take it out and then we get a cleaner data set where we can actually now look at the biology. Um, now, the problem with, uh, um, with uh, applying that to single cell data is that quite often we have very different also compositions in the data sets that we're looking at. So imagine here the different colors represent different cell types. So the red is cell type 1 and it's present in both batch 1 and batch 2 and same for the blue. But then the yellow is a third cell type that is only present in one of the batches and again the Pink is only present in batch one, right? Sorry, I just have a question for the first part. Yeah. If you only have two batches, uh, how can you tell which is the right one? There is no right no, no, no. or wrong. You just have to. You just want to have them on the same scale. You just want to make them comparable so that oh. you can treat it as one integrated data set. And mm -hmm. also something like this would also be perfect if you basically don't have uh, the, the full combinatorics of all your possibilities. So if you can basically have all combinations, then you should have one effect where you only have a batch difference, is it? And then you kind of shouldn't have this kind of effect, or at less extent. So, I'm no, sorry, that's hard to explain. Um, so, when you saw this with the four mouse groups, so you didn't basically have all combinations. So, for example, you didn't have like day one and day two and then four for each. Mm. But if you basically have an effect which is only like on one um, uh, factor, then it should be easier, is it? Because then you wouldn't expect them to be completely different. Yeah, you so need some sort of overlap between the two, is that? Yes, and then it's only like the overlap is, is greater if it's basically just on one dimension or one factor. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this might be something that if you have like lots of different factors in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder just whether it's like. Yeah, so basically it doesn't There's have easier ways if that's the only problem, indeed. 
yeah. it's probably if it's just a shift or something, you just shift it back and that's done. But uh, this is a little bit more complicated than that. If you have different technologies, different, there's a lot of things that are different, and you just but you do know there's some common cell types, so you try to overlap that, and that should account for many more sources. So, so I wonder, this is happens if you have more than one. So if you have many different cell types. Okay, so um, the main assumption when you're dealing with um, when you're doing batch the normal batch correction methods is that you have equivalent samples, and so basically you can compare them. You know that they are representing more or less the same, um, and so any systematic difference between them is a batch a technical batch effect. Mm -hmm. But for single cell uh, data sets, that might not be true because. Um, we can have these cases where we do have some things that are in common, but then if you have these cell types that are specific to each of them, now we cannot say that they are equivalent if we take them as a whole. So we need to actually find what is shared between them and only use those things that are shared to estimate the actual batch effect. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, but we assume that, or we don't care that the same effect applies to other uh, cell types. So if it's a technical batch effect, we assume that that should be affecting everything in the same way. Um, but we can only identify that if we can compare things that are comparable, right? So that are the same, the same transcriptomes, essentially. So um, the way that that was solved in this particular method is by using mutual nearest neighbors. <coughs> there. <laughs> And so um, just to define what a mutual nearest neighbor is, so imagine you have, again, this um, cell from the batch two, and you ask which cell in the other batch is closest to by some distance matrix, ma metric. And so for this uh, red cell, the red cell in the other batch is its closest neighbor, and vice versa, right? So if you take now this cell, the closest neighbor is, again, a red cell in the other uh, batch. If you take the pink cell now, its nearest neighbor is still the red cell because that's whatever, like that's still the closest in the other batch. But we've already seen that for this cell, its closest neighbor is this cell. So these two cells are not mutually the nearest neighbors of each other. So um, in order to protect for us to actually be comparing things that are not matched, we restrict to only using mutual nearest neighbors. So that is telling us that they are comparable in both, in both directions. So once you've identified the mutual nearest neighbor, so that again is going to match all the red cells in, bo in both batches, all the blue cells in both batches, and then the yellow cells will basically not, it, they won't have a mutual nearest neighbor in the other batch. So they just are not used. Um, and now that we know what, what cells we can compare, again, we can just look for those systematic differences between the two transcriptomes and identify them and um, correct that batch effect. So we have these vectors that are uh, representing the batch effect, and when we subtract that, then all the cells from one batch um, can be aligned with the other. And that's applied to, to the cell types that are not shared as well, because the batch effect should be shared across everything. So now everything is in the same plane and should be comparable. And then if you have several batches, you just do this iteratively. So now a third batch can be um, aligned to these cells, now using all of them as the reference. How the method is affected by the, by the choose of the distance, if you agree, Euclidean distance or so yeah, it depends also on the data types that you're having. So uh, I think in this method they use both Euclidean or a cosine normalized data uh, distance. So yeah, you can try a few different things. But you only match one to one. So somehow if the uh, if the groups of cells are not equal, you lose some information. So as long as you have one shared cell type, one equivalent cell type, yeah, then... Yeah, I mean, in the red group, uh, you only uh, compare the number of cells in this, I mean, the, uh, because it's mutual nearest neighbor. Yeah. 
uh, so you have like 10 cells in one group and 20 in other, mm -hmm. you will only compare 10, right? But because it has to go both sides. Yeah, but each, each cell can have several. So if you take, if you have different numbers of, of cells here, yeah. they can still have, be mutual neighbors with, so in a one-to-many relationship. No, they cannot because the cell, uh, which is uh, in the smaller group, can only have one nearest neighbor. Yes. And the uh, relationship has to be both ways? Yes. But so for estimating the technical effect, yeah. the batch effect, you will use all the new mutual nearest neighbors. So you establish all your mutual nearest neighbors, and then yeah. you will calculate the batch effect from all of them, using all of them. Yeah. I think at the end, regardless of the size of the of this yeah. population, like you're gonna correct it, which is what you want, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, but somehow we lose information. What? So you're not. No, I mean, if. Okay. You don't lose information. So the only thing that you're doing is actually finding what you can use to compare oh, the two okay. data sets. Yeah. So everything else is not informative in terms and of batch because you don't have a point of reference. Using the most similar ones is the best way you can do that, right? So using those mutual neighbors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Just one thing. Yeah. Can you change the link between the C and the X and Y? Like, uh, is it really a translation? Because it's always a pure translation. Okay, so yeah. it doesn't change anything. Yeah. 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 <coughs> And so, um, of course, the main assumption of this method is that you have a group of cells that are shared. Mm -hmm. So if that's not the case, then you cannot apply it. I mean, you can, but the results will be wrong. Um, and you should always check that you uh, were able to find a decent amount of nearest neighbors, because otherwise you won't have a robust estimation of the technical effect. So if you only have, as you say, 10 nearest neighbors, then you're probably not very good at actually identifying what the batch effect is. And so the results might not be uh, very good. So yeah, if you try to batch correct two data sets that are completely different, then you will just get nonsense out of it. <clears throat> so this is just what happens if you actually apply this method to those two data sets. You can see that now they are actually clustering by the cell type and not so much by the uh, technology. So this is very useful um, to be able to combine different data sets. We are now at the point where there, is, there are many published data sets, and sometimes you might want to just compare your data to other available data. Um, and so these methods become really, really useful for that. How do you, so you have mutual neighbors, and then how do you apply the correction? What do you do? So you will find whatever is uh, making the two, uh, the two profiles different, but in a, like it's affecting everything in the same way. So you're basically just estimating that, that shift from one plane to the other. And how do you estimate? So how, we have how do you estimate? What, what, what is the kind of transformation do you apply? How do you correct? Um, I, don't, I'm, I don't remember exactly. I need to check the paper. But it's just the, the normal canonical methods for batch correction, except that now it's restricted to using the, new, the, the, the pairs that you've identified. Do you want to cut off on the common difference then for pairs that you consider, or do you just consider everything? So everything that is mutual nearest neighbors. Yeah, but you always find mutual nearest neighbors. You have to put cut off on the distance, do you? You don't you always. So so if you have these oh, cases, oh, then... Oh, OK, so you only... You can find no mutual neighbors. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. Because yeah. then, <coughs> even though the nearest neighbor of this cell is the red cell, this cell will have a different I nearest neighbor. No, sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. It's like you can. Okay. When the data sets are different, you will find no mutual. Yeah, you, know. mm -hmm. you can find zero. How realistic is the assumption that the batch effect affects all the cell types like equally? Let's say it's warmer on day two, so maybe some cell types can cope with this better than others. So like over correct this one and correct other That's always a, a thing that you need to be careful when you apply these methods, that you're not actually correcting your biological 
yeah. effect and that's why the experimental design is important so if your batches are in some way confounded with the question you're interested in and you correct then you're actually going to take out the actual biological differences right so if you have the two groups do you like uh, compare them the do you like check the effect uh, in both groups mixed together or separately say uh, i'm not sure I what mean, you mean uh, do you you have those two groups the two uh, batches you can find mutual neighbors uh, in both groups and then you want to somehow assess the batch effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and do you assess the batch effect separately uh, between x cells and y cells or together so you mm -hmm. the, the batch effect should be the same for x and y so you will do this on a per mutual nearest neighbor basis so for each mutual oh, nearest neighbor per pair you will calculate that batch effect and then, average. and then averaging across all the cells will make this less noisy and more robust yeah. mm -hmm. but we could actually average uh, only in groups and then check if it's like more or less the same between the groups yes in principle, it should be, if it really is a technical batch effect, it should be the same. Yeah, so one alternative method uh, also for batch correction that's been becoming more and more popular is a canonical correlation analysis. So, um, or that's, you know, a method that's used for a lot more things than just batch correction. Yeah, exactly. But it's relatively new to the, you know, single cell analytic data field. Um, so, uh, what this method does is given to uh, data sets that have one dimension in common. So in this case, often it's the genes, right? So you have the same transcriptome, but two different uh, sets of cells. Um, what it does is it uh, finds linear combination of these two data sets that maximize the correlation between the two. So in simple terms, what you're trying to look for is um, co like, um, shared factors that uh, explain variation in both. So it's almost kind of like a PCA, but instead of on one individual um, data set on two at the same time. So um, you try to, um, well, okay, so <laughs> in terms of batch correction, the, the most common implementation is what's implemented in SURA. You might have heard of that is one common uh, single cell package, RNA-seq data package. Um, and so what they do is they first uh, compute co canonical correlation analysis to find the similarities and, do, and then they use a dynamic time warping to actually um, over align the two data sets which, on which top. Which is that again? SURA, S-E-U-R-A-T, like the painter, the pointer painter? No. Um, <laughs> uh, by Raul Sacha lab. Um, so yeah, uh, canonical correlation analysis is can be used for a lot of things. One other common application of this is um, um, trying to combine multiomics. So in that case, the dimension in common is the samples, right? So you have, for the same samples, you might have methylation data, expression data, genotypes, or something. And you might want to try and find a what's in common, so the direction of variation that's in common between the two. And that's another application of this. But um, it's been used for batch correction, so it's worth knowing as well. I think. Yeah. So there's again the. the yeah, that's a paper there. Again, two different data sets that if you just take the counts um, in this case as they are, you will see per, that they are clustering by the, the data set. And, yeah, and after batch yeah. correction, they are actually mixed and clustering by cell type instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. We can go back. So we're going to move ma back now to the Story. markdown. So again, you should have in Dropbox now the markdown for today. Should I start them? No. Yeah. So. It's the same data as yesterday. We can start with the normalized counts and keep going. The first one or the second one? The so, so in day two? In day no, no, I mean the, the, the same data. Oh, as sorry, that's oh. the plate base, the one we did the tutorial together yeah. with. Yeah. OK. Yes, OK. So what we did yesterday was um, mainly uh, QC and then normalization and dimensionality reduction. Um, now uh, let's talk about highly variable genes. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, when we want to understand the structure of the data, um, it's often useful to um, focus on the highly, most highly variable genes. Um, for, for the PCA, for example, yesterday we re reduced the data to the top variable genes, but that was not, um, we had not estimated the variance in a proper way. Um, so to so do this uh, properly, we first need to model the technical noise. And one good way of, of uh, estimating how much technical noise we have in the data is to use spikings. So um, the spikings um, should only, the ERCC should only be affected by technical noise in practice. And so one way of, of trying to estimate how much uh, there is of it is to look at the concentration. So when we get uh, the ERCCs, we get a kit and we know exactly what concentrations there will be in it. So we can compare the expected concentration, so the concentration we put in, and what we actually observe. Right? So, and that will roughly uh, fall on the diagonal, but you can see that at especially a low level of concentration, so down here, there's quite a lot of noise. There's quite a lot of uh, deviation from the diagonal. Yes? Is this clear? Okay. So if you remember yesterday, we showed you those scatter plots of technical replicates of just taking the same sample twice, and we could see that as when the material gets very low, sometimes you detect the gene, sometimes you don't, and we just need to know at what threshold you consistently detect those okay. genes. So in this case, all the lowly expressed ones, you can see that very often they are zero in the actual observed. Yeah. But, um, so you know that at those ranges, you are not consistently detecting them. And so it's just dominated by no noise. Yeah, so uh, from roughly 0 to 100, a lot of things in terms of observed concentration stay at 0, right, instead of representing. OK, um, so um, now to define highly variable genes, there are different methods. I have been developed. Uh, one of the first one was developed by Brennicke et al. in 2013. And that's what's uh, on the left here. What it does, it, it's, it models the mean CV squared trend. So on the x-axis is the mean, the average uh, counts. And on the y is the CV squared. So this is the variance divided by the mean squared, the coefficient of variation. Um, and so we then model the trend based on the spike ins, right? Because we just said the spike ins should be uh, just technical noise. And so we want to detect genes that are more variable than just what's expected because of the technical noise. So uh, the, you then define highly variable genes as those that show significantly higher variation than what can already be accounted. So this is the trend. Indicate the blue dots here are the spike ins. You simulate a trend on that. And then um, at a significant, uh, I think, couple standard deviations above the trend, then uh, everything that's more highly variable than that, uh, we will call highly variable genes. So of course, the, the main assumption is that only few genes will be highly variable genes. So um, a similar uh, method that um, is implemented in Scran, and it's actually what we're going to use, um, performs a similar analysis but instead of being um, of, of modeling the trend between mean and CV squared, we now look at the trend between mean and variance. So this is the variance of the log counts and the mean of the log counts. And again, we fit a trend using the spikings, and then everything uh, that's above that trend we will call highly variable genes. So everything above this red line will be defined as highly variable genes. Um, those two methods are. Um, perform quite similarly. The, there's a few differences, mostly. Um, uh, the second one is more uh, robust for um, to outliers. So there's very, very highly expressed genes because we're looking at the log count. The log of the variance will re be relatively low. And so we're not going to define that as so a gene that is mostly zeros and then twice very highly expressed will not be defined as highly variable genes because that's more likely an error. In the first method instead, the first method instead is better, at, um, more sensitive to like very rare populations of cells. So depending on what you need to do, uh, you might want to try one or the other or both and compare. But the idea, you, you see, it's it's roughly the same, right? You you fit a trend based on something that just expl ex that's just explained by technical noise and everything that's more variable than that. There's probably some biological vari variance in there. Yes. <laughs> 
when you fit on the first one, yeah. do you remove like do you have a cut off for the average normalized return? Because the fit curve it goes like very yes. yeah. Yeah, so the same yes. as with normalization, everything that's really low, we just ignore because it's just way too noisy. Because on the right, you don't do that. You have like the fit goes all the way basically there, in a way. Yeah, so so on the on the right, you're working with log transform data. Uh, still, there there still will be a cutoff. So in this, this is just the mean, and this is the mean of the log. So this actually only starts. So that's why it starts at there. No, yeah. less than zero. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the thresholds that you take in the first graph, can you repeat what those lines are? I know that they're related with the spike in this and so on. So the, the red line here is exactly the trend that you fit um, based on the spikings. And I think. Um, this like is. Cut off, is it? Because it doesn't go all the way left. So you must have like a. Either, either they don't yeah. Because it's yeah, so there's, there's a cut off, yeah. So you're ignoring everything that That's is very low. Yeah. 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 And, and you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you don't do that. Uh, this is my, I mean, you, there's no data outside uh, the red line. To the left from the In, beginning of the. On the right one. There's, again, there's, again, it's because it's log. So there'd be. So, so you're actually start starting zero. from zero, right? Yeah. Everything so that's So you're doing below. log counts plus one, so your smallest value is zero. Yes, yeah. but still you take all the... Yeah, but you take all the data into account, and here mm -hmm. you don't. Yeah. yeah. So that's one main difference, right? In this case, you're using the logs, so you're controlling for different things. Yeah. But it's not about the logs, is it? It's about when you start your fit, basically. So on the left, you kind of ignore the small average number as we can, so we don't take that into account for your fit. But on the right, the fit actually covers the whole range of the expression. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so it was the first one is the trend, and the second one. So it's just the threshold of what you are going to define as highly variable. So you yeah. just say whatever is. So what's pink there is highly yeah. variable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In this case. Oh, and, and in here, it's not colored by everything above the red line. I mean, but in the left method, it's like you, by highly variable gene, you mean like highly variable and highly expressed gene, because you've got nothing like nothing on the left. So if the gene is under expressed, the method won't detect it. Yes, because yeah. the genes that are expressed at low levels have such levels of noise that you just cannot yeah. know whether that's technical or biological. You just have no power to differentiate the two. Yeah. Also, that's actually CV squared, so it's divided by the mean. So it is, in a sense, controlling for the mean, right? CV yeah, squared no, is the. I mean, just you don't you don't detect any genes that are lowly expressed. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. uh, pink on the left. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that's all gonna be the case for that's always, yeah. always, okay. and including also bulk RNA seq, right? So we right. Can only, like, yeah, you'll uh, see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it is also possible to do this if you don't have spikings, so you can still model the, the mean variance relationship. And then you're, um, you're under the assumption that most genes will not be highly variable genes. So you can, this roughly represents the trend of the endogenous genes as well. Even if you didn't have spikings, you probably wouldn't have a curve that's much different than this. But um, of course, it's less robust, it's less, you trust it a bit less. Uh, if you don't have those spikings. Okay, so we can apply it to our data. So you, you should have this um, SC norm, um, normalized uh, SC object, and now we're gonna apply the second method, so it's what, what's implemented in Scran. And so there is a function that's called trend var that is gonna uh, model uh, or find that trend. And he's gonna use the spike since, since we have them. And then uh, we're gonna, based on that fit, find um, find the variance. And so we can plot uh, exactly the what we had before for our own data. So we can plot uh, the mean, what, what's called uh, dollar mean will be exactly the mean, and then what's the total is the total variance explained on the y-axis. And we can um, color uh, the spikes 
in red. And so that's the last bit, the points. Yeah, so we, you should have this chunk if you run it. That's what you find. So then, uh, based on the FDR threshold, we can um, test. Uh, we can define highly variable genes. So we use five percent here. So uh, false discovery rate five percent, and so um, we define those as HVGs, and then we can see how many we find. That's roughly, yeah, two thousand four hundred. Okay. So is everyone following up to here? Where do you? Where does the FDR? Yeah, so I see you have this curve fit now, and you assume that above the curve it's like a yeah. higher stress. But where do you put the book? Where does the FDR come from? Um, so um, it's the if it. So the function, the compose bar, is actually. So the, the p value is. The test that, so the, the null hypothesis is that it is not a highly variable gene. So that's the likelihood that it is it's actually more variable than just the noise that. for that particular yeah. mean expression. Yeah. yeah. And so again, for all of these functions, it's always quite useful to just read the help page for them. They're quite well explained, and they will have all the rationale of how things are done and what results they're giving you. So we don't have the time to go into all of it, but um, yeah, if you have a chance, you should, should just have a look at that as well. Yeah. Okay. So you can also uh, take everything um, for which the uh, the FDR is higher than five percent, or what we ca called HVGs, and plot that onto that curve. So in this case, we're coloring in blue. So roughly everything that's above that line will be significant. You can try and play with the FDR. Uh, threshold and see that looks a little bit better if it has a few more genes or depending on what you're looking. And I think one nice thing uh, is to actually look at these genes and see that indeed they seem to be um, highly variable. So this is just the top um, genes that were identified as high, highly variable. You just said we're just plotting the expression. So. In some cells, they're very, very low. In some cells, they're pretty high in terms of lock counts. They're highly variable. OK. Um, so, uh, so we can re redo the whole uh, dimensionality reduction analysis, but now we can use these properly defined highly variable Gs instead of just taking the top 500 uh, most variable. Um, and so we can uh, create a new single star experiment object that only contains those genes. We can call it SCHVG. Um, and, and then do exactly the same as we did before. So again, calculate the PCs on, this, um, on these genes only and the TSNE. And in this case, we're pl plotting both the PSC, PCA and the TSNE side to side, uh, colored by the plate proliferation date. So again, if you had strong batch effects in here, you would see that they are clustering, for example, by their plate instead of being all intermixed. And you'd have a better chance of finding it using the highly variable genes, because they should really um, capture all the vari variation in the data. Again, this is good experimental design, so you don't really have um, batch effects. Yeah, I guess. So it's nearly time for the coffee break, so we will stop here.